Ephesians 2, verse 18 through 22. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I have a question for you this morning. If you could be anywhere in the world right now, where would you be? Where would you go? Who would you be with? Would it be Bora Bora? Some of you might want to be in Paris at the closing Olympics in a couple of hours. Maybe a cruise, the Mediterranean cruise, if I'm going to go on one. A famous city. Maybe having dinner with Taylor Swift. Like, those that are like, no, you know you'll be first in line. Like, yo, forget Travis. Forget him. I'm going to win her heart. Maybe a dream date. With the person you just can't get the nerve up to ask to have coffee with. But we would all desire and hope to be somewhere ideal, a perfect setting, a perfect moment. For me, honestly, it would be at some remote, amazing hotel with just my wife, no kids, where we can get room service and just chill for a couple of days. And your parents say amen to that? Yeah. Kids are like, huh? What's up with that? You'll understand in a few years. But here's the crazy thing. God chooses out of all the places within his creation in the cosmos, God is not, you know, hindered by time or space, by oxygen or heat. He can chill on the sun. He can run around the rings of Saturn. And he chooses to be with you. He chooses and desires to be with me. God, the creator of everything, wants to be with us. Take that in for a second. Can you imagine? Some of you are like, man, if I could take a break from myself, I would. And God's like, no. And he doesn't just want to be with you. He just doesn't want to just go on a date. He doesn't just want to show up at the ceremony in Paris and then leave, you know, the next day. He doesn't just want to go on a cruise and then long, probably on day three or four, to be back home in your own bed. No. It says his heart, his desire is to dwell with us. God wants to dwell with you. Do you know what that word dwell means? You don't? Let me tell you. It means to remain with. To have residency. To live with. To abide. To rest in. To stay. God wants to stay. God wants to make his home with you. When Jesus says, let me in, we talked about this last week, he doesn't just want to come 
and just eat our food and then leave. He says he wants to make his home with us. God wants to dwell. He wants to reside. He wants on his W-2 to put his address as the same as your address. He wants his mail to come to your house. That is crazy. Did you ever think of it that way? We're always thinking about going to heaven. Being with him one day and God's like, no. I want to be with you now. And here's the crazy thing. In the beginning, if we open the Bible to Genesis, and we start reading Genesis 1, the beginning of the story, says the creator, Elohim, our father, God, he created the cosmos. He put it all together. It wasn't just good, it was perfect order. The way he dialed in and created what we live in the midst of. And then he created this earth. And then he continued to dig in and create everything we see, touch, smell, and feel. God is the architect. And just like any architect that builds anything, it is down to a blueprint, a specific. It's intentional. It isn't haphazard. Man, from our oxygen levels to the carbon to everything, if it was just a little bit off, there would be no life. If the earth was a degree closer to the sun, there would be no life. We would just burn up. If we were a degree Further from the sun, we would be in a perpetual ice age with no life. God was specific. God designs a place that he called paradise, a garden for us to live in. And God said, when everything else on that sixth day, he said, let me create man and woman. In my image, he created us and he put us into paradise, the Garden of Eden, to live. And not just to live, but to live with him. That's how the story begins. And then if you ever read all the way at the end of Revelation, the story ends the same way. Revelations 21 and 22 talks about a new Eden, a new creation, talks about a new Jerusalem, restoring paradise to where God can dwell with us. Listen, in Revelation 21 verse 3, he says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself. Say God himself. God himself will be with them and be their God. And in verse 22, it says, I did not see a temple in this new city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, Jesus Christ, are its temple. From the beginning to the end, God's heart, God's intention, what it was always been. We might scratch our head. We might wonder why. We might look at each other and say, why go through all of this for us? But God sees it a different way. He says, you are my image bearers. I created you. You are my sons and daughters. And he wants to dwell with us. 
He wants to have his residency with us, in us, and with us. This is amazing. And we know the story. There's a fall. Sin comes. And all the things that come with sin, death appears. The enemy and the lies come on in and rob us of our natural inhabitants. That's the way you need to think about it. The garden is our natural inhabitants. It's what we've been created to live in. We're like taking a lion out of its natural inhabitants and putting it in a concrete zoo in the middle of Manhattan. Y'all saw Madagascar, okay? Doesn't work. Our natural inhabitants is the garden. Our natural inhabitants is a relationship with Jesus, a relationship with God, filled with the Holy Spirit and him dwelling with us. It's beautiful. But when that sin came, you know the story, we're out. But also, we weren't just out and forgotten. God kicks in a plan. And that plan was to redeem us. That plan was to restore us. That plan was for us to be made new again, like everyone that went into the waters today. To have this new life and for him to dwell with us again. We see it in the Old Testament with the temple of Moses. God gets specific again. He dials in. He gives instructions. He's intentional. In the old Hebrew, they, the, the similarities between the temple and creation and the creation account, it's similar where God is creating a place for him to dwell. In the New Testament, we see it also. Let me read a scripture to you. So in Exodus, you'll see these instructions in five chapters of Exodus 26 through 30. But in Exodus 29, verse 44, it says, So I will consecrate the tent of meeting in the altar and will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them and I am the Lord their God. But God's plan wasn't just for one specific people in one specific time and age in one little area of the world to dwell in. His plan was to dwell with us all. In the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, it says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst. If anybody destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred. It's set apart. And you together are that temple. We together are that temple. God's plan from the fall, through Christ Jesus, was to restore all humanity and to restore us in a way that we become God's dwelling place. Together, we become God's dwelling place, that he will make his home with us. Man, that is incredible. So if God's desire today is to dwell in us, let's look at Ephesians once again. Ephesians 2 verse 18 says, For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Who's this both? To this church that he's writing to in this time was Gentiles and Jews. The ones that had a covenant with God and those that did not. 
For us today in our context, it is those that are Christian or those that may be visiting here or listening online. And you're like, I never went to the baptisms of, you know, I never went into the water. I never accepted you. I don't know if this stuff is true. God's saying, both of us. Whether you're unbelievers, if you are human, he's saying, you are part of this. And he says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizen with God's people and also members of his households. Woo. In case you were wondering, in case you're like, Pastor Mark, you're going too far. God don't want to make his house with us, make his home with us. Oh, no, no, no. In verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. On Jesus Christ, we are now part of something. And in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple. And this holy temple, in, in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God comes through his spirit. This is good news. This is amazing. This changes everything. God wants to dwell with us. God's dwelling place is here with us. But how does that happen? Does it happen just by coincidence? Do we trip into it? I would dare say if God was so intentional and specific in the garden, if God was so intentional and specific in Revelation, if God was so specific in the Old Testament with the temple and what had to happen, what couldn't happen, what could be in that presence, what couldn't be in that presence, then that applies to us. God would be a hypocrite if he said, I cannot dwell in the garden anymore because sin has come in. You have fallen to the father of lies and you have turned your back to me and you now are living the way you want to live. So sin and death are here. I cannot have fellowship. Me, I mean God, saying I am that which is holy can have no fellowship with that which is unholy. So you got to go. If he did it then, and if he did it in the temple, where if a priest dared to go into the Holy of Holies, where God dwells with sin in their life, do you know what would happen to them? They would die. They would drop dead. Moses was like, God, I, I can't even walk. This is holy ground. I can't step on there. And God said, take your shoes off. Come. When Isaiah saw a vision, when God showed up to him and he had this vision of God, he said, God, I'm not worthy. My lips are unclean. There's sin in my life. I'm unclean and I live amongst an unclean people. And God said, don't worry. I'm going to purify you so you will be worthy of being in my presence. And that's the same today. We don't want to fall into legalism, but we must look at our lives. What I mean by legalism is it doesn't become do's and don'ts, us jumping through hoops and us trying to earn like, okay, maybe if I clean my house enough, then he'll be want to come in. And then he'll come in and be like, no, nah, this house ain't clean. Enough. No, no, that's not the heart of God. God says, I want to make you whole. Listen to this. The atmosphere matters. The place where the Lord dwells matters. In Revelation 21, after he said this new creation, new Eden, he says at the end of that chapter, 
In verse 27, he says, Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, meaning Jesus. Through Jesus, we have this grace, and he makes us new, not just symbolically. What you saw this morning was an outward sign of what Jesus has done through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to where God wants to dwell in us, that he calls us the temple. But we can't have the junk. Have you ever been in a holy place before? And this mostly applies probably to Christians, but even you don't have... This could happen with those of you that have had no experience with the things of God. You go into a holy place, it could have been a church, you know, a prayer room, whatever it is, and you immediately start to repent. You're like, I'm not worthy. You feel his presence. First thing I do, God, forgive me. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my pride. Forgive me for my arrogance. Forgive me of my selfishness. Forgive me whatever it is, God. I go so far in the morning to ask God to forgive me of my self-deception because I realize self-deception comes to everybody and I also realize if I'm self-deceived, I wouldn't know it, right? So I'm like, God, show me my self-deception. Show me so I can take care of it. But in the meantime, forgive me of my self-deception and the things I do without even knowing it. God, Cover me with your blood. Cover me with the Lamb's blood. I want to be made holy. This is our hearts. But see, the work of holy transformation is the key to God's dwelling. We love to give our heart to the Lord. We love the feeling of the Lord, whether it's through worship, you know, service, through prayer, through, you know, and, and we have that feeling. That's the beginning. God renews our heart. He doesn't transform it. He renews it. What I mean by that is I could have a renewed heart, loving Jesus, going to the waters, I'm baptized, I'm a new creation, but I still have the same thoughts. I still have the same habits. I still have the things in my life that God wants to take away. And this is what being built up into maturity looks like. It's now starting this process of being transformed, of being made whole, of getting rid of the old and embracing the new called maturity. It's called growing up. The same way a child grows up. That's why the Bible says we're born again. We're like a little child made new, whole, beautiful, innocent. But now we got to grow up and learn and begin to make choices that impacts our relationship. Can you imagine if your significant other, your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your fiance, you know, you get into a serious relationship and they're like, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to dwell, baby. I'm ready to dwell. We're going to dwell. Yeah. You're going to take my name. We're going to dwell. Excited. But yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. But yeah, those, those other girls, those other guys, don't worry about them. They're nothing. I might spend some time with them. Might be gone a night or two out of the month. But don't worry about that. I want you to dwell with me. Now see, some of us, <laughs> we don't know who we are. We don't know how holy we are. And we might even compromise and come into such a perverted union. That's what the enemy would try to bring you into. God is not confused of who he is, of what he is. God is whole. 
God is pure. God is righteous. God is holy. So he's like, nah. You don't want to get rid of those side pieces? You got nothing to do with me. I'll be waiting right here to dwell. Get your house in order. That's why it says in Romans 12 too, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This scripture is amazing. We'll unpack it in the weeks to come, but I just want to throw out three questions to you to think about. What does pattern of this world mean? What does, when he says, <laughs> don't conform to the pattern of this world. Do you know what the pattern, what does that mean? The pattern of the world generally refers to the values, behaviors, and systems prevalent in society, influenced by the enemy that are contrary to God's ways. It is the very place God cannot dwell. So if we live in that world, God said, I can't dwell in that world. Because that world is filled with sin, filled with pride, filled with hate, filled with death, filled with anger, filled with selfishness. Filled with lust. Filled with rage. I can't dwell in there. But I'll send my Holy Spirit to work on you. To work with you. To make you a place where I can come and dwell. What does it mean to transform your minds? To have a transformed mind. It means undergoing a fundamental change in the way you think, perceive, and understand the world around you. Not just thinking this is the way I was raised. This is the environment I've been brought up in. This is what my daddy used to tell me. This is what my political party says. This is what, you know, I learned in school. This is what I saw in video. No, it's different. It involves shifting from a mindset influenced by worldly values and beliefs to one that is aligned with God's truth and wisdom. It's making choices and applying God's truth that welcomes the dwelling of the triune God. I'm going to say that again. It's making choices and applying God's truth that welcomes the dwelling of the triune God. It comes down to your everyday choices. What is his good and pleasing will? His will is for us. It's his will is for us is to be transformed into an image bearer. To be transformed into the image of God. That's what the scripture says. To become sons and daughters. How many times, for those of you that come to this church, you see my boys, every time you see me, you be like, yo man, <laughs> Roman is you. Yeah, Luca, oh my God, Luca's a Palumbo. Am I right? They're image bearers. How much more God as our, as our father, we are his sons and daughters, we are called to be an image bearer for him. That, and here's the deal. What does an image bearer mean? It means to live out our true identity, calling and purpose through the triune gods dwelling in and with us. It is being who God created you to be. Your identity. It isn't what you feel like this morning. It isn't what you chose. You might live that out because of free will. But in your mama's womb, God set us all apart. God set us all apart. He made no mistakes I don't care if you even had a mom or daddy like, man, you were a mistake. That's a lie. God knit you together intentionally the same way he created the world for him to dwell in. The same way he created the temple and gave the specifics to Moses and Aaron so he can dwell in. The same way when he restores Eden, when he brings forth the new Jerusalem so that he can dwell in that same exact way. Yeah. 
God knit you together specifically on purpose. He knew everything. He had every single dial so different that we can't even read your entire DNA and that your entire DNA is completely different. But you know who wrote your DNA can read your DNA and knows everything in it and has set us apart. You are called by him. Your identity is found in him. You have a purpose that goes beyond finances and houses and stuff and jobs. You have a purpose. You are an image bearer. You are the dwelling place of the one true God. And he brings us together to dwell with us, his church. So in closing... I remember for me, I was sharing this with a a grad student from Sacred Heart last week. Not sure if he's in the room. Had a fabulous conversation with him. And it brought me to remembrance the night I gave my life to the Lord. When I came to the Lord, I was 22 years old. I'm 51 right now. Man, that whistle was un, wasn't needed. Was that you, Orlando? Little Timothy back there. I remember it as if it was yesterday when I gave my life to the Lord, when I said yes to him, when I finally opened up a hard heart that ran from him for 22 years, and I opened it up and said, God, come. I won't go through all the details, but I remember that night alone in my room crying out to God and saying, God, whatever you want, I'll do it. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. Any of you ever had those moments? Not just when you were saved, you had other moments too. And I remember God saying to me, Marco, give up your friends. And I was like, I don't know if that's God. It's not like this is an audible voice. It's just a feeling in my heart. I don't think so. That, that doesn't sound right. I love my friends. I grew up with my friends. I'm going to lead them all to the Lord. And I really, God saying, and when I say God saying, it was a feeling on my heart. It wasn't an audible voice. I just knew it was a conviction within this new Holy Spirit that was in me. And I remember God saying, Marco, I love them more. Give up your friends. Now, I was a knucklehead from the east side of Bridgeport. So I was like, but God, I'll give up smoking. I'll give up drinking. I'll give up partying. I'll give up trying to sleep around all the time. I'll give up all those things, God. You know, I I can make my list of the sins in my life and try to control the building of this house so that you can dwell in and that's what we do we try to that's why it's not a legalistic thing you cannot come up with the list of your sins of your faults of your weaknesses and think that you can control them to make your place a dwelling of the lord so i was like okay lord i was like lord what do you want me to do hang around with my parents and you know what he said to me marco do you know your parents i was like man because I realized, man, I didn't, even, like, I didn't even know anything about my parents other than the things I wanted from my parents. That's a selfishness of youth. Not all youth are that way, but a lot of us are. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 So then, I was like, all right, Lord, I'll do it. I'm going to give up my friends. God is my witness. In the months, in the year to come, Man, I mean, God, God did it. It was hard. I had some lonely time. I had some lonely nights hanging out with my parents. I was showing up to church whenever it was open. I joined the sound team. The guy at the time was like, uh, Marco, you're actually, you know, you, you actually just, you can't be in sound. You're tone deaf. You just, 
right? I'll try to join the worship team. They're like, no. I was like, I join everything. And within a year, by being faithful to what God put on me, not being controlling, not trying to do it, but just being faithful to God and saying, okay, God, I'm going to do that. Not only was I not smoking anymore, not getting drunk anymore, not partying anymore, not doing any of those things because he took me out of that environment, but he created a new environment for me, a new atmosphere where he can dwell. And in that, within a year, I was a coordinator in the children's ministry. I was a leader in the youth group. Man, I was doing everything else. And then God brought me as a youth leader, as a leader, with teenagers, with an organization to El Salvador to do a mission trip where I'm on the streets and in the hills and the jungles of El Salvador sharing my faith. I mean, it's the place where I gave my first real sermon. I tried in the youth group before I left. That went horrible. Some people in this room were actually there for that. Some of them saved me and took it over and cleaned it up. But man, I preached and fell in love with preaching on the streets and in the schools and the orphanages of El Salvador. The first time I ever dared to lay hands and pray for somebody to be healed, I saw a healing that God used me. And I was like, this is crazy. I remember near the end of that trip in El Salvador, we had this free day and I walked all the way up with the group to the top of a live volcano I think that's the right wording it wasn't active because active means but the smoke was coming out it was crazy it was and I remember standing on the top of this mountain this volcano with like the smoke coming out the red clay in the sun because we walked up in the morning when it was still night to get up there we saw the sun rising on the top of the volcano I saw just this beautiful land and here I am, this knucklehead from the east side of Bridgeport that never left the northeast in my life, was never on a plane before. And I was like, God, how, how did I end up here? And I remember God saying, guess what he said? Because you trust me and you gave up your friends. And here's the thing, if I didn't give up my friends, I would have still been in the same atmosphere, still hanging around with them, and I wouldn't have been able to stop smoking, stop partying, to have a new mindset, to be transformed. The Word and the work of the Holy Spirit would have been like, can't get anywhere. You keep on, you just keep on keeping. And this is what we do with our life. And I'm not saying this because I'm something special. I'm saying this because once again, I was just a knucklehead from the east side of Bridgeport with some immigrant parents that was just living, that knew nothing of this. My mind was blown when God showed up. And the Bible says he's no respecter of persons. If he did it for me, if he did it for Bishop, if he did it for my wife, right? If he did it for Sade, he's going to do it for all of us. What are the choices you have to make? What's the atmosphere you need to set? Know that if you are the temple and there's false idols in that temple, God's like, I'm not going to show up, which happened in Israel. God's presence lifted. Because Solomon was putting up all these false idols, all these false temples, as if God was just going to be one of the many gods in Israel's life. No. So I challenge you this week, with all that you're going through, with all that you're facing, you might have a list of the things you want to do and need to do, and that list might be right on. My list was on point but I couldn't accomplish that list on my own and I couldn't accomplish that list by telling God what to do on it I needed to just say okay God I'm here talk to me 
Lead me. Show me. He'll put a conviction on your heart. He'll tell you to break up with your fiance and it'll be the hardest thing you do in your life. And you'll have that crossroads to go through. Break up with my fiance, lose the down payment on the hall, you know, get just ridiculed and go through embarrassment. And just, and then through that, get a hold of God's divine identity, calling, and purpose for my life and go through that process and be exactly who he's called me to be or just say it's too hard and just compromise and start saying, did God really say? Did God really say? And the enemy's like, nah, he didn't really say that. You need this. So today, Let's get rid of the compromise. Today, when it comes to being God's dwelling place, let's get rid of the try. God's not a, a sushi restaurant that you've never eaten before. I'll give it a try, see if I like it. No, no. God said, taste and see the good and pleasing of who he is. Stand up with me. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this day. I thank you that from the beginning of time to the end of this age, your heart, your goal, your purpose, your intention is to dwell with us and that we will have no more sin, no more trauma, no more dysfunction, that your heart, your goal, your intention is to make us new, not to control us, not that we have to, you know, get rid of the good things in our lives, but Lord God, that you are the good, good God, that everything that is good comes from you. Enemy, you are a liar. We reject your lies, your pitiful schemes, the things that you tried to bring doubt and confusion into our lives, into our homes, into our church, into our community, into our region, into our country. And today we say it starts with me. God, if you said that I'm a temple, if you said we as believers through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit are temples, of your Holy Spirit where we come together so you dwell we pray right now show us help us give us your Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us to be our counselor to be our teacher so that as we go home inspire us just like you did with me 29 years ago to make the hardest decision of my life that bore fruit that is being reaped in my kids' lives and my wife's lives. Right now, we speak it right now for every single one of us. We thank you, Lord. And we thank you that you just don't hit us up with truth and righteousness, but that your grace, your compassion, your mercies are new every single morning. And now we fall and we can get back up. We can fall and get back up as you perfect the work in us as we mature to be everything you've created us to be. We speak that right now in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Before you go, pastors, come on up. Before you go, look at me. Don't move yet. The next baptism, I believe, is October 27th. Sign up is online. This week, make those choices. Whether it's coming to a prayer room, whether it's opening your Bible in the morning, whether it's shutting off the TV, whether it's <laughs> sitting down with your kid and having a heart-to-heart -heart with them, whatever it is, do not allow this week to go by and allow the Holy Spirit to just pass by your door. Open it up, welcome them in, and let's do this work together. Amen.
Amen. God bless you. We love you. Have a wonderful week. If you're new for the first time, my wife and I would love to meet you right up here on my right side.